happening now, what is going to happen in the future, and what are all the implications. First, uh, I'm introducing, and we are absolutely, it's our pleasure, and we are honored to have you, Max, here. Max Tegmark, who is a, uh, who is a physics professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the uh, scientific director of Fundamental Questions Institute. Uh, he's also a president of the Future of Life Institute, and uh, which recently launched a seven million uh, research program for keeping artificial intelligence beneficial. Now, with more than 200 technical papers, Mr. Tegmark has featured in dozens of science, uh, science documentaries. His work with the SDSS collaboration on galaxy clustering shared the first prize in Science Magazine's Breakthrough of the Year 2003. Max, please tell us how current technological developments alter the balance of society security and beyond. So thank you so much, Dilakis. Thank you so much, Georgia. I'm so an honor to be invited to this, and I'm delighted that you're organizing this. I also want to thank Unicre, European Union, and everybody else who's made this possible. We just heard about what our organization the Future Life Institute is perhaps best known for so far, this uh, $7 million research program that we've just launched. But uh, before delving into details about that, let me take a step back and say a few words about technology in general. Our organization consists of uh, a lot of thinkers who love technology, but who, um, as Cindy Smith, very, very, uh, eloquently put it here earlier, feel that technology is something that both can empower and do fantastic good in the world, and at the same time, gives us new power to screw up in even grander ways than before. So we feel we want to do everything we can now to make sure that technology gets used for good. If we look at not very powerful technological inventions, like fire, for instance, we use the strategy of learning from mistakes. We screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the fire extinguisher. But with more powerful technologies, nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, etc., we don't want to learn from mistakes. We want to get things right the first time, because that might be the only time that we have, right? And uh, the way I think about this is to create a, a great future for humanity. We want to win this race, this race between the growing power of technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage the technology by investing more in this wisdom. We're going to hear more in this session from Pierre and Daniel and Nick about <coughs> nuclear and bio and, and AI. But let me start by talking just a little bit about nuclear weapons. Because even though I want to end up with talking about AI, I feel that while we celebrate our successes here in the national action plans and in CBRM, it's very important to at the same time highlight our failures so far to learn from them when we take on new, more powerful technologies so we don't repeat past mistakes. And I think that nuclear weapons is a great case study of, of inadequate risk management. Why do I say inadequate since we still haven't had a global nuclear war? Well, let me just ask you this question. Which one of these two people is more famous? And let me ask you a follow-up question. Which one of these two people should we thank for us all being alive here today because you single-handedly stopped the Soviet nuclear attack during the Cuban Missile Crisis? I'll give you just one hint. He wasn't Canadian, right? <laughs> so that already says something about how little attention we as a species pay sometimes to, to really important issues. And moreover, I would say the lesson that we should draw from this is that, that you know, relying on luck is a really poor long-term strategy. The issue with Vasily Arkhipov was just one out of a hair-raisingly long string of near misses with global thermonuclear war. And although we've mostly focused so far about nuclear threats from terrorism and crime, we must remember that there have been also a lot of close calls where we almost had an all-out nuclear war between superpowers. And even if the chance is as low as 2% per year that that happens by mistake, uh, you know, the probability that we're going to screw up then within centuries is virtually 100%. So we need to do better than just hope for luck in the long term. If you play Russian roulette long enough, we all know how it ends. 
the second lesson I think we can learn from, from the nuclear case study here is that it's really important to understand risks in advance before you fully build out the technology. And I feel that we epically failed with nuclear weapons here. I feel personally guilty uh, about this because I'm a physics professor. <laughs> I feel this was our <laughs> fault, partly as physicists. So let's look at the, quickly at the facts. When nuclear weapons were first built, the, 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 the decision makers and scientists generally thought that the, worst, the, the main risk was that you would literally get blown up by it. And people had these risk assessments that if things went really, really bad, maybe we would kill 300 million people or something like that. Now we know that that's hopelessly naive and that this is not even, that getting blown up by it isn't even the number one largest risk to worry about. For example, oops, now this is a photo from downtown Las Vegas in the 60s. You see the mushroom-shaped cloud in the background? That's how close it was to downtown because people had totally underestimated the dangers of radioactive fallout. And acknowledging that now the U.S. government has paid out more than $2 billion in damages to settle these downwinder cases, and there have been more people who were killed by fallout from these peacetime nuclear tests than who died in Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. But that's also not the number one risk, even though it was a big oopsie. In the 60s, it was realized that if you set off one single hydrogen bomb 400 kilometers up above Earth's surface, you can create an electromagnetic pulse of tens of thousands of volts across pretty much the whole continent, potentially dis permanently dis disabling electronics, cars, cell phones, the power grid, uh, which can lead not only to catastrophic infrastructure meltdown, but also if you have a long power failure together with all these with thousands of, of, um, of nuclear devastated cities, then there are additional oopsies people hadn't thought about. For example, if you, if you actually have a long-lasting power failure in a nuclear power plant, you know what happened in Fukushima? Well, if, if you don't keep the pumps on that circulate the, cool, the, the water that covers these spent fuel rods in pools like this one, it boils off within a matter of weeks. Then the zirconium cladding on the fuel rods catches fire, and then you get a super Chernobyl, and you, you could get that basically all of these fuel pools. There are 300 of them here, as I only draw, draw, drew little wind plumes around F five of them, but you can imagine if you do that around all of them, it's, it's just further adding to the misery. I'm highlighting this at the meta level just because these are things that people hadn't thought about for decades and decades while, the technology, while we built tens of thousands of these weapons. And, yet, and we still haven't talked about even the worst risk that's been discovered so far. Right now, if we, if we were to actually use a, a large fraction of the 16,000 nuclear weapons that currently exist, many of which are on hair trigger alert. So we could have, if you think of the largest couple of thousand cities on Earth, you could have them all destroyed within an hour of right now. Uh, if we were if to, to do that, then our nice looking planet here would, before too long, look you know, maybe potentially like this. As, as the soot from the firestorms rose high up in the atmosphere in a shrouded Earth. And, and this was not realized how serious this would be until the 80s, you know, about four, four decades after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And although this had a very powerful influence, this research and pers helped persuade Gorbachev and Reagan to negotiate the largest nuclear cuts ever done, uh, it turned out that unfortunately these calculations were, were rather inaccurate. They were made on a supercomputer which was less powerful than this phone, and uh, it turned out that they were too optimistic that more modern calculations done by some of the world leading climate modelers on real today's supercomputers show that this might last not two years, but more like 10 years. And for the following summer, you can see here the temperature drops. This makes global climate change seem like peanuts in comparison. You see in the, in the American breadbasket, Ohio, for example, the temperatures are dropping by 20 degrees or so. That's Celsius, so 40 Fahrenheit for, for my American friends. And if you look in, in, so in Russia, China, you get drops of like 30, 35 Celsius. What does that mean in plain English? Well, we don't have to be agriculture experts to realize that if this turns into this, when you're going to harvest, it's not so awesome for food supply. And one doesn't have to make fancy calculations to realize that rather than maybe having a few hundred million people killed, as in some of the worst case scenarios that people had in the 60s, it's very plausible that the vast majority of all people on Earth would starve to death and then succumb to 
pandemics and other things that would have followed. No, not great. And, and the, the thing to take away from all of this, I think, is, is simply that this is an example of where we built the technology first and realized a bunch of what the main risks were way, way later. And as we get more and more powerful tech, we want to learn from this mistake and really understand the threats first so that we can avoid them in the first place. So in that optimistic spirit, let's uh, take a closer look here at the artificial intelligence. This is a technology which has wonderful potential, of course, to do great things. And uh, we've all seen how it's been making a lot of progress. The, the earlier, the early progress in AI tended to be involved, like when Gary Kasparov lost to IBM's Deep Blue, for example, good old-fashioned AI where some human programmers taught the machine to do something that it could then do way faster than Kasparov and beat him. Um, <clears throat> similar sort of old-fashioned approaches that are very successful now are self-driving cars and to some extent when, when uh, the Jeopardy Deep Blue was, his quiz show was won by IBM's Deep Blue. However, most of the most recent breakthroughs that have happened and there's been a real, real ser amazing series of breakthroughs just in the last five years where things that people thought would take decades to accomplish have now happened all of a sudden. Most of that stuff has involved a completely different approach where the machine actually learns like a child. It's, it can take vast amounts of data and using, using deep learning and other techniques that Nick Bostrom will tell you about can actually learn to do all sorts of things that the programmer has no idea even how it did it. Just like your children learn to speak your language and you don't even know exactly how they did it. So look at this picture for example. And this is something that was science fiction five years ago that was done last year at Google. You just send in the pixels of this image and the computer says that's a group of young people playing a game of Frisbee. You send in this picture and the computer says, oh, that's a herd of elephants walking across a dry grass field. And we don't really know exactly how the computer did it because it just learned you know, from massive amounts of data. We'll hear more again from Nick about a little bit of the, under the hood of what's involved in this stuff. But I just want to talk about um, quickly two um, issues that this raises. So first of all, there is the uh, there's a so there are two completely separate issues we should not conflate. There are near-term issues with technology that pr almost exists right now, and then there are longer-term things about if machines get smarter than us one day, what might happen then. Nick will tell you plenty about the latter. But in the very near term, let's talk about our AI weapons a little bit. So our organization recently launched an, an open letter on autonomous weapons, where, which was signed by over 20,000 people and, and about 3,000 of the world's leading robotics and AI researchers. And this open letter was very much inspired by the chemical weapons convention that we heard about from Dita Tsiganikova and the biological weapons convention that we heard about from David Fix. Why did these people these researchers sign this. Well, people who go into biology generally want to make the world better. They don't go into it because they want to make bioweapons. People who go into chemistry, they want to make the world better, not to create chem weapons. And it's the same, of course, with these AI researchers. They want to use AI to cure diseases, to help alleviate poverty and do great things, not to figure out new ways of mass murdering people or destabilizing the world. And they feel concerned that their, te their technology that they're building is being bastardized for really destabilizing uh, uses. What are some of these things that these people worry about? Well, uh, we, for example, today when, when drones are used to kill people, it's always a human who makes the decision, who's remote controlling the drone from somewhere. Right? But th within years, we, we, we'll have the technology that we can completely eliminate the human from this. Just have the drone fly around for a few hours, find somebody, ha use its own AI software, just like that elephant recognizing things, saying, oh, this is the person who looks like it's our enemy, and then have it, have it killed with no human in the loop. Uh, a big risk with these things is that if once any superpower goes ahead and mass produces this thing, of course, all other superpowers are going to want to do so too, and we'll have an arms race in our hands. But this arms race, these researchers feel, will be very, very different from the nuclear arms race. Uh, because whereas it's very expensive to build nuclear weapons and very hard to get hold of the materials, these weapons will be incredibly cheap. You don't need any hard to obtain the materials. A quadcopter costs a few hundred bucks on Amazon.com today. Uh, software costs nothing once it's developed. And you can have the potential that, that someone 
or the axe to grind for you know, under $1,000, you know, let me back up. If superpowers build this, if you get the arms race going, before long, North Korea is going to decide to build it and, and so on and so forth. And before long, some country in the need of cash is going to sell this on the black market. And then, and then all sorts of, of non-governmental organizations with an axe to grind will have them. And these are perfect weapons for, for example, assassination. You can program in the, what your nemesis looks like, have a thing fly for two hours, identify the person, kill him, and then self-destruct so no one knows who did it. It's great for ethnic cleansing. You can program these things to look for a certain ethnic group only and kill them. They're, they're very, very cheap. Uh, you can imagine uh, swarms of little bumblebee-sized things which, which just recognize the face, find the eyeball, which is the sort of softest part of the skull, fires a little bullet there, which is very cheap, and you don't need a lot of power, kills people. If you have thousands of those, you know, it, 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 it would completely transform warfare in a way that's very hard for, for nations to defend against, other than by creating a police state. And for this reason, uh, there's a very quite broad consensus among the researchers in this field that this is an arms race. We just shouldn't start. That's the best way to stop it. And I want to just conclude by pointing forward a little bit towards uh, Nick Bostrom, who's going to follow me here, looking at superintelligence. Sometime in the future, maybe in 40 years, maybe in hundreds of years, maybe never, we'll see, there's certainly the possibility that we might make machines that can do everything that we humans can do. And then what? Well, we, our organization organized the first ever conference of AI researchers to talk not about how to make things smarter, but to talk about this issue in particular, how we can win this race and have wisdom per, keep pace with the technology. It was in Puerto Rico in January of this year, and it was actually really productive. There was a very strong consensus that emerged that this is something we need to think about. The goal of artificial intelligence should be redefined from having the goal of just creating pure, undirected intelligence towards creating beneficial intelligence. And there was a very long, we brainstormed up a, a very detailed action plan, a list of research projects that should be done that would tackle embarrassing unanswered questions that we need to answer. And we need to, it might take decades to answer them, so we should start researching now, you know, not the night before a bunch of guys on Red Bull you know, switch <laughs> on their thing. And what was very exciting about this was that Elon Musk was present at the conference and he said, look, I hear you guys, you want to do this research? Well, let me give you 10 million reasons to do it. And with his donation, we were able to launch a worldwide competition for our research ideas. We were overwhelmed by getting 300 teams from around the world putting in wonderful proposals. And uh, it was very painful for the experts who had to review this to, to pick out winners. But 37 teams have now been selected and have started to work on this. And um, it is, uh, <coughs> I think, going to be very, very exciting to keep following how this develops. We view this as just a little bit of seed funding for the wisdom. And I would encourage all of you with resources of governments and big organizations to remember that if we want to win the race between the power of technology and the wisdom with which we manage it, we have to be mindful of the fact that almost all the investments right now just go into making the technology more powerful. There's almost no investment on the wisdom side. So if, if you're involved with any organization that could help a little bit ramp up this sort of research, you would do humanity a wonderful service. Thank you. Uh, Max, uh, thank you very much for this absolutely inspiring and wonderful presentation. We are now at Uniquely trying to invest in the wisdom side, certainly, and uh, want to have you join us in this endeavor as well. Uh